OK. What is Britain? <clears throat> Yes, the oral exam is just about your project that the code developed, yes. And so if you, so the, how, how the exam works, exam work that you, <clears throat> you have to deliver a project in code according to specification that we are going to give you differently from each exam session. You have to deliver the exam by the date of the exam. I, I will grade it and I will give you a score uh, up to 24. If you get 12, you can access to the oral exam. If you don't get 12, you cannot. And if you decide to access the oral exam, you get whatever score you get. So if you jump in the oral exam, there is no way to say, oh no, I forgot. I changed my mind. And the oral exam, is six point maximum. So if you come in with 12, you can at maximum get 18, plus any points from the big lab. Hmm? So you, you can do your math according to the score that you would like to have. But again, if you, if you accept to be in the, in the other exam, it's, that is the, the score that you get at the end. If you are not satisfied because you don't know you you get 20 and say okay 20 plus 6 plus 2 is 28 I would like really uh, like to have 30 just don't come to the oral exam so that you can submit a new version and but the oral exam will be just on your code I will show you your code I will make question on your code and you hopefully should be able to reply to the question to, on your code. Not immediately, you can think about it, but not, let's say, not immediately, but not even after 50 minutes. Let's say something in the middle, it's fine. Because one moment to, to think about it, because maybe you, you finish it one week ago, 10 days ago, it depends. I can be, uh, it can pass two days for the correction, or more, it depends. If in the first seat you all submit a project, I need to grade 100 projects and that w won't happen in two days. This will happen in one week or more. So, and then we have the oral exam. So it will, will be long, so it's fine if you don't remember exactly immediately what you do, but after a while, then you can uh, have a look before the oral exam, etc. But it will be just on your project. So why you did that? How this work? Can you show me how you do the login? That's not the question, but let's imagine that it is. Uh, how do you do the login? So okay, you go there, this file, this method, this middleware, and then go on the server from React, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Question on your code, on the code that you developed. The goal of the oral exam is to make sure that you did or you know the project you developed. It's not that you ask somebody else to go do the project with you and that you submit it and it's fine. It's to check that you understand what you did and why you did that. Okay? Let's open a parenthesis on, on the exam. So let's speak about the React lifecycle. That is the topic that we'll, uh, we will follow for the entire next week, and for the next three hours in addition to this hour that we have, um, that we, we are going to start. So uh, in the past we said that, um, for instance, we state that when changes state, the component re-render itself. That is, that's true, clearly, but there are several moments in the life cycle of a component uh, connected 
to the rendering of the components that we never uh, speak about. And these three moments are mounting, updating, and unmounting. So the mounting of a component is when a component is created and inserted in the DOM. The updating is when the component is re-rendered, for instance, because the state is changing, and the unmounting is when a specific component is removed from the DOM, for whatever reason. Because you change page, you delete a component, you insert a new component, but these are the three moments in which uh, things happen. And we typically perform the mounting when we create a component and add it immediately. And then with use state, we manipulate the updating up to now. And then actually in the mounting, we don't do any specific op operation. We just see the components are mounting and, and that's it. And all of this here happens in the rendering phase. This one is the rendering phase. Uh, and then there is a commit phase that we don't really call it in that way, but we said that a component at a certain point of React updates the DOM, the real DOM in the page. So React works in two phases. One is the rendering, when it's create everything and put it in the virtual DOM, and the other is the commit, when send is update with all the calculation into the, the real DOM and perform all the elements. In the commit phase, there are two hooks that can be used. But not in the rendering phase, like the use state, that trigger rendering indeed, but after, after the component is mounted, after the component is in the DOM, on the page already, ready to be used by the user of your web application. And these two hooks are use effect and use layout. And we will focus here on the use effect. That, as the name say, is to handle side effects in functions, in functions components, in functional uh, components. Uh, because as you remember, every component in React as we defined is a function in a functional style, so it should be self-contained and use props and state to calculate its output. So any calculation that the function does that does not target the output values of that component is called a side effect. So anything else that doesn't matter with the rendering and the output of that component, the behavior of that specific component is a side effect. A console.log is a side effect because it doesn't change anything related to the output of that component. It prints something in the console of the browser. Clearly, console.log is a very simple as a side effect, but still is a side effect. And here, there are examples of side effects in which the, the first that we, we care most is the first one that is also in bold, that is data fetching, getting information from a server. That is a side effect because it doesn't directly impact the output of the component. Maybe, maybe not, it depends, but surely that operation of fetching data has nothing, nothing to do with the output of the component. Maybe the results of that operation can, but the operation per se, the fetch, has nothing to do with the, ren the components itself, the output of the components. So that is called the side effect. And the component rendering, just to make things more difficult, so the component rendering and the component side effects have logic that are totally independent one from another in React. So it's a mistake to perform a side effect directly in the body of the component. So in the render phase, we shouldn't have side effects. 
side effects run after rendering and updating the DOM, always in React. Hmm? So all side effects run in that moment, after the components is rendered, after the component is shown on a page, whatever the side effect is in React. And so if you look at the first example, we just see uh, a component, it's called greet bad, that is just a message and return that message as a string, hello, name, plus as a props, as a div, and then it has a console.log here. That console.log here, that is nothing strange if you look at it, is actually a side effect. So actually that function is called by React in some moments after the rendering. And the problem is that we actually don't know when it will be executed, we as developer. So that side effect will be executed when React decide to re-render and commit on the DOM. Is this going to happen never, once, twice, immediately after three minutes, we don't know. We have no way of controlling that. We can hope that at a certain point that console.log will happen with some data. That is the right data, the wrong data. It's all outside of our control if we write something like that. So in the case of console.log, it's probably not a big deal, but if you imagine fetching data from a server, well, we want to have control. Maybe we want to have the exam data before rendering the full table. Not at a certain moment in the future, whatever React decide. So to have more control on that, side effects are confined within a function that is actually a hook that's called use effect. So if you want to control the side effect of that console.log there, you can inside the components write use effect, arrow function, console.log in the body of the function, and then a parameter that we are going to see. In this way, side effects are under control. And they will always happen in the commit phase once, let's say, depending on what we put here in this parameter, actually. But at least we have control. So side effects, that is, again, everything that doesn't affect directly the output of a component or the calculation of the, or the output of components needs to, be, needs to go within the use effect hook with one main exception, the side effects that are linked to an event handler. When you click something, maybe you click the add button and then you open a form, the add button after filling out a form, and then you send a post request to the server. That is a side effect because it doesn't affect the output of the component, not even of the add button or the form, actually, because it affects maybe the table of the exams, if we think about our example. That is a side effect, but that side effect can stay in the event handler. Because the event handler, by definition, is a side effect. It's something that the user triggers at a certain point. So they are treated by React in a specific way. But everything else that is not in a event handler must be and it's a side effect, must be in the use effect. So use effect is a very dense API with a lot of specific small cases that can, and small things that can happen, including infinite loop. You can have a use effect that continues to trigger itself forever and react a certain point, tell you, you are going to have an infinite loop, I'm going to stop here after a while, after cycling a few, a few times. So the use effect has 
two parameters. One is, so we are going to see all these exceptions, the main ones, not today, next time. But this affects two parameters. The first one is the callback, what to execute, the side effect to be executed. And the second one is an array of dependency. Let's say when to execute that side effect or those side effects. So the callback contains the logic of the side effects and use effects execute the callback after React has committed the change to the screen. After the user seen the browser, the component on screen. In that moment, use effect triggers the callback. The dependency is an optional array of dependencies and use effects execute a callback only if at least one of the dependencies have changed between renderings. So as soon as, if you have a specific dependency, if the dependency change, the callback is executed at commit time. So which could be these dependencies? You have three options. The first one, there is no array specified, just empty second parameter. And no arrays means that you want to execute the callback in the side effects at every rendering of the component. You want to perform that operation every time the components re-render itself for whatever reason. You can also have an empty array, just an array like here. This is an empty array, clearly. That means that we want to execute the use effect, the callback, just after the first rendering. So when the page builds itself. The first rendering, the use effect is executed, and then if there are any re-rendering, that specific callback is not called anymore. So not provided, always executed at every re rendering. Empty array, just the first initial rendering. If you have values, dependencies in that array, they could be proper props, they could be state, but you have something in that array, that use effect callback is called at the initial rendering, so like the empty array, and every time one of these dependency change. Hmm? So, to sum up, not provided every rendering. The callback is executed at any rendering of the component. Empty array, just at the initial rendering. With a value provide, at the initial rendering of the component plus every time that value, that properties, that state, that variable change. Hmm? Independently from the fact that the change trigger a render or not. If it's a state, probably will also re-trigger a rendering. If it's a prop, probably not. Hmm? Three cases, and these tell you when the callback is executed. And here there are, well, example, but it's essentially what I already told you. So you see here there is an array with prop and state, with state is a variable state, and props is the props passed to my component. So every time either props or state change, the function there is executed or and when the initial rendering is performed. So let's see this an example. So we have a button on our page that when you click on it, increase a number that is stored in a state of one. So you have one, you click it, it becomes two, you click it, it becomes three, etc. And you have defined uh, this count that has two use effects. 
one with an empty array and one that is dependent of the specific num, num property. So, first of all, the first one is expected to be executed once at the beginning. The second one is expected to be executed once at the beginning and every time num change. So every time you press the button to increase num by one. Hmm? So if you imagine that uh, the number is three, start from three, uh, you have this output of the program. So when the number is three, the component is rendered, this use effect is called, and you see my stating number is three. Because it's the first time the component is rendered, there is just the button and the number three. So it's the first time. But then, if you look here, you see the three appears twice. Because also this is called when you have the initial rendering. Oh, because somewhere in the program they put it three. They initialize this uh, num state at three. It's not written here, but okay. It could be also one, and you have my static number is one, my dynamic number is one, my dynamic number is two, three, etc. But it starts from three, for whatever reason, in this example. So when we have twice three, do you get it? Why do we have twice three? Because the first one is related to the first use effect, the second one is related to the second use effect. That is called whatever props.num is changed and at the initial rendering. Hmm? So the second one, in a way, includes the case of the first one. Hmm? And then when num is changed, Given that num is uh, in a props, hmm? uh, you just perform this every time num is changed. Hmm? The second is a fact, not the first one. Because in the first one, just happened in the initial rendering of the components. Hmm? So just once. So this is what happens in React. So the components count is created with this number three and mounted in the app. Then the function call count is called and use effects, the both use effects are registered because here we are in the render phase. Just register it, not execute it. React remember that he has two use effect to call after in the commit phase. Then the JSX component is returned here. This one is the JSX with the number three. The component is just mounted, commit, and so the first is effect is executed. But then, since it's initial rendering, also the second is effect is executed because of the initial rendering. Also, the second case happens, and then. Everything stops there until the person using the application click on the button, this button here, click on the button to increase the number or to decrease the number. In this case, it's to increase the number, to change the value of that number. In this case, increasing. That increase the, key, the number. So the up state updates, because this is set number, so in another components that is a state. No, number changed to four. That is passed to the, this function, clearly. Function call is called for render, because it's to receive a new props. The new JSX is returned with four, this line here. And since props.num is changed after the rendering, after the committing on the page, then the second use effect is called. 
Not the first one, because we are not in the initial rendering anymore. Hmm? Yes. Yes, nothing. At after every rendering. We will have three, oh, it depends how you, you put it, but yeah, we will have three for sure. Um, yes, we will have also these, probably in some cases also, also multiple, maybe four, multiple five, it depends how the other, how, the compo how many times the components will render. So in this case, we just have a component that is dependent from a number. So it's render every time the number change. But if you imagine a component with two, two, two states or number and then an internal state, then the components render when the state change and when the props is in the new props. So if you just have nothing, that component, that use effects will be called every time the state of this component is change and every time the number is changed and every time React decide to render the components. So more time than, than in this case. In this case, yeah, probably it will be very, very similar to this because it's very, very simple. Okay? So when you state we have the first particular case, because we know that you state changing a state uh, will uh, trigger a neural rendering, but will not necessarily trigger a use effect even if it's listed as a props, as a dependency. Uh, because when the state change, mm, the, the, the component is rendered and etc. But if the state is update and the value of the state does not change, the effect is not run. So if you move from three to four, that's a new number, it's fine. If you move from three to three, that's a new state because you put three inside a new state. The component renders, but use effects is not triggered. It's not executed. Because use effects doesn't only look on the props, but compare if the current value of the, of the dependency, sorry looks doesn't depends on the dependency but look if the current value of the dependency is different from the previous value of the dependency if it's different then execute if it's the same that does not execute so always keep in mind that use effect depends not only from the specific value you put in the properties but is triggered is executed in the commit phase when the value change. It's different from the previous one. Even if you, again, if you have three in the state, you put again three, the use effect is not triggered because it's st still the same as before. And this is these are a nice, a very nice um, consequence with objects when objects are always different from itself. So even if they don't change, they will, the use effects will trigger. So there is things to pay attention when using object and array, and we are going to, to see that. Um, inside a use effect, you can, uh, you can clearly, it's code, you can trigger, uh, you can schedule a state update, but you have to remember that we are in the commit phase, so after the rendering, after everything is on screen, so the state will be updated after the entire effect is finished asynchronously, so at a certain time in the future. And then if the state will change, the component is re-rendered again, and so maybe the use effect is triggered again, or maybe not, depends on, on the code. Hmm? But you can set a new state within a use effect callback but just keep in mind that that new state will happen after the entire use effect callback is called. It's complete execution asynchronously 
are as set state behaves normally in any case. Mm -hmm. And then there's a new state, so everything like in the past happens. The components are rendered, etc. And we we'll start from scratch. So here there is another example to say that. Mm -hmm. We have a quick gate component that has a state that is open, set open and open, initialized to false. Um, and it has a button that say go or stop. And when open is true, it say go, otherwise say stop. And when you click, you call an open bin function that set open to true. And the use effect set a timeout of half second setting the set open to false. So what is the intended behavior? The intended behavior is that you click go, you change the state, and after around half a second, the state change back to false, and you see stop in the button. So you, can, you click on, stay on for uh, 500 milliseconds, and then go back to stop. It's a quick gate. So you trigger the go and then it becomes stops after a while if you don't do anything. And this after a while is the set them out. Again, which is the timeline? This is useful for understanding how it works. So first of all, the quick gate, quick gate component is created and mounted. Then this function, quick gate, is called. Use state create the variable open with the default value false. Then use effect is registered as in the past, not executed, registered to be executed later in the commit phase. Then the JSX, uh, in this case uh, stop, is, uh, is returned. The component it's mounted, the effect is triggered, the timeout is set, after half a second, more or less, the timeout expire, set open is executed, open becomes false, actually in this case stay false, because originally it was false, so it stays false in the first execution, and since the state is the previous value of open is equal to the current value of open, that callback is not executed in that moment. Because false is now, now it's false and previous was false. Then at a certain point, the person click on the button. The person click on the button, the open me callback is executed and set open true. State open becomes true. Component is re-rendered since the state is update. JSX is returned with go. In this case, use effect that is still registered finds that the open value here is changed because before it was false and now it's true. So execute the set them out. After a while, set them out expires, set open to false, component renders, JSX is returned with stop, use effect, find that open is changed because it was true and now it's false, and so another set them out is called, etc. Hmm? So this is how it, it will work in the process. And notice how the use effect happens later, hmm? after the rendering. So when you specify a uh, dependency, an explicit dependency. No. When you use a state or a props inside a use effect callback and you don't specify it 
in the dependency array, React will give you a warning. Will warn you that you are using a state or a props inside a callback, but it's not reported in the dependency array. So most of the case, in most of the case, that warning is something to consider. Because probably you want your use effect to depend on that value if you use that in the callback. So most of the time that warning is actually something to keep attention. As, as a general rule, if you use something inside the fact, it should probably be in the dependency array. There are cases, and there will be cases, in which you really want not to do that. Because maybe you uh, specify that the callback should happen only if another variable is set to a specific value. So that if something for React is, oh, there is a missing dependency, let's throw a warning. But in your case, it's just a check. So as a general rule, if you use something in the effect, it should probably be also in the dependency array. But and React gives you a warning in any case, if it's not. But pay attention that there are moments in which you don't want to put it in the dependency because you just maybe need to check that value for enabling or not enabling the calling of a specific uh, callback in the use effect. Mm -hmm. So that warning most of the time should be considered seriously, other time it can be skipped. Uh, if the array includes variable dependency that always change when executing the fact. Maybe it's, you have an effect like, if it's true, put it false and vice versa. So that always change after the fact is executed, you risk to have an infinite loop. Because the dependency is false, use effect set it to true. And then the dependency is true, and so you trigger again use effects, it becomes false. And then the dependency is false, and so different from before, and use effect try to put it to true. And then it's true that it's different from false, etc. So you trigger an infinite loop in this case for use effect. So pay attention what you write inside use effect and the dependency array. So how we can put fetch in this equation? Hmm? So, so use effect can perform, is the preferred way to perform data fetching request, side effects inside a callback. Uh, so you can write hmm, at a certain point, await fetch, etc. all the code that we have seen uh, up to now. And when you get the response, you can, for instance, set a state with the JSON coming from the response. So that state will re render um, something, etc. Uh, notice one thing here. And let me clear everything. Notice that we use a wait because it's a fetch, returns a promise. But we don't use a sync here in the use effect. We create a function, an additional function, like we did for the main in the previous example, and we call that function. So even if we have a callback, that is the callback of use effect, and in theory, we can use, we could use, Use effect, open parenthesis, async callback. We don't do that because it's not possible to do that. Because if you do that, React gives you an error. So the use effect callback cannot be asynchronous. Must be written in this way, synchronous. So if you want to have an async function, you have to create an async function within the callback. 
use effect doesn't allow you to have an asynchronous callback. Then inside the callback, you can do whatever you want. But in the callback, definition cannot be asynchronous. Mm? If you try to do that, again, uh, it will give you an error. Mm? And this is what is written here. Or you can use then and catch. In this case, could you use the then catch? Yes. Yes. But if you want to use a sync await, you need to define an additional uh, async function. Otherwise, it's fetch dot then, and you, in the body of then, do all the other operation, and then response dot then, response dot json dot then, and then you do all the operation in this second then. Clearly, yes. That is apply only when you want to use the pair async await. Hmm? So the callback cannot be an async function. Inside, you can do whatever you want but inside a callback. Okay, so instead of watching this example here, let's do a real example. So let's open our React score. That is the React score that we, we had in the past. But now we want to connect it. And then there are a lot of other things to say about use effects, but are most related to adding or updating resources with data fetching that not in get. And then we will go into that all next week. Let's keep uh, the get for now. That is also what uh, you will be asked to in the big lab, just to connect the two things with get, with get request, no post, no put, because there are a lot of other uh, specific cases to consider for that things to, to work well. So we have our React application, the one that you developed with Luca, uh, with uh, the multiple pages, edit, add, etc., with the router. Exactly that. I just added this file here. That is not correct. That is the same file that we had in the React score server. I just copy and paste here and I forgot to, to change the import, because here we are in React, so we, we should write import and not uh, require. Mm. And this is the, the, function, the construction function with the exam. That import the JS and export everything else, er everything, nothing special. I removed the load. Because in our application React, we don't have this concept of a load. We just have the score that includes everything as we build the application. Mm -hmm. So when we need to generate an exam, we just we don't need the load. We just need the, the score, the full score. Mm -hmm. 30 or 30 plus L. And then it's the same as the exam file in the React score server. We just the import and export set up for the browser environment and not for the node environment. And then I created this api.js file that is empty. And what will do you, what will host this file? What we're going to put here? No, we are in the React score application. All the fetches that we're going to do, all the call to the server APIs. Hmm? So let's, let's start to do that. We, we need one API in this moment. That is just the get all exams. Hmm? So uh, we can define a function and we call it get all exams. And I can define it as sync, since we know that we are going to 
to perform a fetch. Mm. So this is a file, api.js, in, in which we are going to put all our fetches. Mm. So that when the when direct application needs to call something on the, on the server, <coughs> we just need to write api. the function to call on the server. We are creating a layer of APIs, an internal layer of API towards the server, essentially. And we can create a get all exams. That is the get that we have. What we need to do here? We need to write a fetch. So, we need to write a fetch. So, await, fetch, which address? Which address? HTTP, that was the easy part. Localhost, another easy part. Then, <laughs> stop it. We can use a proxy, but that will mean configuring React in the proxy development mode that is not compatible with cores because there are alternative solutions. So if we go with the cores way, we need here to use a different server and not the proxy. That is another solution, but it's alternative to this. So here, which is the port of the server? We are going to, to do the same API slash exams. The same call that we did one hour ago, essentially. Hmm? Uh, so we can write const exam JSON equal await response dot JSON. Yes, we can have if response dot okay also. We can also have here if response dot okay. Better to have it before actually, but. So if response is okay, we can parse the JSON body of the response, store it in exam JSON, exams, JSON, and then we can return all the exams. Hmm? Hmm? So for now, exam JSONs in this way. Then we're going to fix it. Should we? No, because stringify, json.stringify is to bring a JSON object into, J, sorry, a JavaScript object into JSON string. Here we are going to do this, the, the opposite, like we did before. Hmm? We receive a body with a JSON inside and we need to generate the JavaScript object corresponding to that. And then we need to export all of these. Maybe in the right place. Um, so since we are going to do multiple API, let's just do an export of in this way. Since we are going to use multiple, we are going to generate multiple APIs in the coming weeks. So we're going to put all of them here in this object and then we export the entire object as one name that is API. So that we can write API dot something in the React application, in the rest of the React application. But here, we don't want to return exam JSON. Because exam JSON, if you remember, if we can have a look in the server, exam JSON is this one. Code, name, credit, score, load, and date as a string. And we don't want data as a string, 
but as a DJS object, and we don't want the loader. So we cannot return these, because if we return these, our React application would expect something like this. Because this is what we put in the state in this moment. So we need to do some changes. And that's why there is this exam.js file to use that constructor function to build the exam list as the rest of the React application expected. So here, what we're going to do exam.json dot map exa and we are saying new exam and we need to import exam from here And here we need the code, and we already have x.code. Then we need the name. So everything is, is the same until the score. So we need the name, x.name. We need the credits, add.credits. We need the date, x.date. And then it's the constructor that will build the DJS object. And then we need the score. Hmm? with the loader included in it as a string. So we can say that x.loader question mark. So if we have a loader, we can pass as a parameter x.score plus L. Otherwise, we return x.score. So we just pass all the parameters, and then with score, we just do something um, different. And then, if response is not OK, where is the error message? Nor, nor, more or less. Where is the error message here? No, response.status is just 500. But the, uh, the message, the error message, if we have an error message, we have for some APIs an error message in JSON format. Where is that? In the body. And where is the body? No? Where is the body? In exam JSON. Because we already get the body. It's, it's already JSON. It's just the wrong body. Hmm? So what we can do is move this line before the if. Because if a response is OK, exam JSON will contain the exam list. If a response is not OK, exam JSON will contain the error in JSON format. So in both cases, we will have something in this exam JSON. Hmm? That is the, the body, the response body, either correct or not. Hmm? So if response is OK, we can parse it and generate the list of exam. If the response is not OK, because it's an error, then we can, for instance, here say else throw exam JSON. So we are going to throw an, except, throw an exception with the content of the error that we have in exam JSON. So here, this is our APIs, essentially. This is our fetch. And if everything is fine, we will get back the response. So what we need to do in app? Well, first of all, we need to get rid of the fake exams. 
because we want to get the exams from the server. We need to import API that we, already, we just created. We cannot initialize the exam state with fake exams because we don't have fake exams. We can leave this empty, we can put it an empty array in it, just initialize exams. And then what we need to add here inside the app component, because it's here where we set up the exams. Use effect, exactly. So use effect. Let's put the callback. And then we need something here. What do we put in the callback? And fetch is already in the API, so. We should write something like api.get all exams. But this is an async function. So either we say dot then, and we process the response that is the exam JSON we create there, or we can create a function as we did before, that we call it get exam. That is an async function because we need to use a wait. And inside this function, we can now write const exams equal await API get all exams. And as soon as we have all the exams coming back, we can say set exams with exams. We can set the state. And the state will trigger a re rendering of the table that will start as an empty table and then will be filled out. But this is just a function declared. We need to call it. Hmm? Because it's a function inside a callback, we need to call it like we did with the main in the example before. And here, which is the dependency that we want to put of this is effect? Nothing, empty array, array with something in it. Empty array. He's saying empty array because it's just at the beginning. Do you agree? when we need to get all the exams in our application. Do we need it at the beginning or not? Yes, yeah, so we can for sure at least put an array. Do we need it in another moment? Right now, do we need it in another moment? No, maybe we need it when we do an add to get the new list, maybe. But right now we just have this get, so we need just replace the fake exams list, so just the beginning. So an empty array is just once at the beginning. And then we have done. No other changes because we replaced fake exams that filled out the state with these that end up filling out the state, the same state as before. So if we run all of these, Uh, it's already, yeah, when, when I write it, yeah, we should include this effect together as we do use state, but when you write, sometimes it's imported. But yeah, sure, we need to, to import this effect like we imported the use state. Okay, so let's try this, and then in any case, we can stop it. So uh, here, we need to start the server that is already 
made with cores, so we can run it, and it was the same port as before, so it should work, node server, and then we should go in the React score and say npm install, that I didn't. and then npm start. Uh, DGS is not defined. Oh, yes, import DJS from DJS, maybe. So if we refresh the page, we see, we can open another tab and see it from scratch. So if we run the application, we immediately see that we have the table failed because the server is very quick in answering. So what happens is we have the empty table for a moment and then the use effect is triggered, the server responds, reply back, and everything is re-rendered. But since the server is on the same computer and everything is very, very quick, we don't see this double rendering. We cannot perceive this double rendering. If we slow down the server in any way, then we will see the empty table, and then, after a while, the full table. But since everything is on the same computer and is not very, very complex, as an applica both applications are not very, very complex, is immediate the results. <coughs> But these are exactly the things that we have in our database. Okay? Okay, if you have any question, I will still be here for, for a while to unplug everything. Otherwise, in the lab, you will do something like this with the get, with the get for the filters, with the get for all the movies, just with the get. And then next week, we will continue with the use effect, with the post, with the put, with the delete, etc. Have a nice week.